Welcome to Change Now. I'm so glad to welcome you from all around the world. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Change Now 2021. You are joining today from 150 countries. This is living proof that the seeds for change are everywhere on the planet. Since the last time we've met in person here in Paris with 28,000 participants, the world has been hit by an unprecedented crisis. And as you will hear from many speakers after me, this is a critical decade. In the darkest hours of this crisis, we launched a general call to all changemakers to rally forces and keep the global agenda for climate, resources, biodiversity, and inclusion moving on. And you responded massively to this call. Now, our role here, collectively, is to make something about this moment. See this online gathering as a university, or the marketplace for a better future, or the LinkedIn of impact. So connect, discover, and take up speed on subjects. This is an accelerator event, maybe the best place on earth during three days to grow your impact. This is also an unprecedented event, not only because of digital, but also because this is the first time ever that we have so many experts and leaders of change accessible to anyone for free from anywhere. Usually, we do that at the end. But this time, I like to do it at the very beginning. This year has been extremely tough for anyone on the planet. And for us, organizing this global event has been an oversized challenge for the small team we are. But we made it despite everything. So I would like to, st to start by paying tribute to the Change Now team, to the 22 souls who have embraced the challenge and made all of this possible. I hope you will feel the magic we put inside this edition. We created it with our hearts, with our full determination and dedication, and with a great sense of purpose. And with the ultimate goal that people you will meet here, decisions you may take, or ideas you will hear, will eventually have a positive impact on your lives. So may this edition bring you all faith in our ability to act and wisdom because action and wisdom is what we need. And now, without further ado, I'd like to check on Rose. Rose, where are you? Hi, Santi. I'm here in the second studio on the vegetal stage. Because even if Change Now is digital this year, the backstage here is very physical. We have recreated four recording studios to host all the speakers who could make it of course, in total respect of the sanitary measures. We have also equipped nearly 2,000 square meters of space in Paris for all the teams that make the platform live. Because Change Now is not only the conference, you'll see also many other activities during the three days. A world expo with 300 hand-picked exhibitors among the most promising solutions for the planet. Discover them connect, exchange directly with them. You will also see three full days of pitch sessions with juries of experts and a job fair on Saturday to help you connect with mission-driven recruiters and maybe find your next job with a positive impact. We're also hosting a film festival with a selections of films in free access during the three days, as well as an art auction actually the first sustainable art auction on Friday at 6 p.m. Paris time. Change Now 2021, it is also 
tens of workshops, 20 ecosystem highlights and partner events hosted directly on the platform. And last but not least, thousands of networking opportunities for you to connect with change makers and accelerate change. What we are experiencing today is exceptional. The challenges we are facing are unprecedented in the history of humanity. And it is up to us, up to our generation, to address these issues urgently. But what is also unprecedented is our ability to act together, to be connected wherever we are in the world. And this digital event is giving us a big opportunity to do so with three days of global collaboration and action to change the world. Now, I believe you are all waiting for the show to start. So let's go. It's time to change now. And Kevin, I believe you have a special guest. Yes, indeed, Rose. I am in great company this morning or this evening, depending on where you are in the world at the moment. I am with Kimball Musk. Hi, Kimball. How are you doing? Where are you calling us from? I'm, I'm uh, calling in from Colorado, uh, United States. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be part of Change Now. We're so excited to have you with us, you know, Kimball, for the fourth edition of the Change Now Summit. You are actually the very first entrepreneur to be sharing his work with us at Change Now. Many change makers will follow you over the course of the next three days. And I do hope that you'll have the time to watch, to connect with them and share your expertise because they do, you know, have a lot to learn from you. Thank you. I'm really excited. I heard there's a really good attendance from South Africa as well as the United States. So uh, I'm excited to be part of it. Yes, there are actually many people watching us from South Africa, from the US, from all the regions of the world. And I'm taking this opportunity to say hi to all of you who are watching us from the five continents. So, as Rose said before, it's time for change now. So let's get started. So, Kimball, you know, I understand that you started as a, as a very successful entrepreneur with Zip2 and, and PayPal that you founded with your brother, Elon. I'm really curious to understand, you know, what was your next step? What prompted you to get involved in projects that really cared about people and the planet? Well, you know, my, my background, I grew up in South Africa. I, I, uh, I, really wanted to, I, I, I really wanted to pursue the American dream. And uh, it has been wonderful to be here in America, to uh, be surrounded by some of the best entrepreneurs in the world. There are wonderful entrepreneurs el elsewhere, but, but it, America, uh, for me, was was just uh, was was wonderful to be around those, those folks. I, I found it was a journey for me. I I I got I I tried to to do things that just made money back when I was younger and found it uh, very hard to be to stay motivated. Uh, the good thing was I learned that I was a good entrepreneur at a young age. I I, I did a house painting business as an entrepreneur while I was in university to pay my way through school. And I actually, for, for a student, I was very, very successful and financially well off um, and also completely bored out of my mind. I, 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 that kind of a business did not, it's nothing wrong with house painting, but it just did not move me, didn't have the kind of impact that, that I need to have in my businesses. And so I learned early on that, that money is not a motivator for me and I'm good at making money and also not interested in that as as the outcome. Uh, I've I've learned over time that that money is simply a way to enable you to to uh, uh, live your purpose. And for me, my purpose is food. It's helping create a more happy society, a better Earth. As change now is very much uh, along those lines. You're right, Kimball, and I think that's actually something that a lot of us can relate to. This idea of pursuing means without any purpose. Well, I'm kind of curious to understand, you know, you, you created a few organizations related to uh, the food sector. Could you tell us more on how exactly you got there and, you know, explain a little bit more about the concept of, you know, behind Big Green and, and Square Roots? What's th that concept of learning gardens in school and, and, you know, why is it so important to you? Sure. Yeah. So I, I, um, I think it 
the story starts with with uh, me being 12 years old and cooking for my family in South Africa. I love cooking. It was a way to bring my family together. As you can imagine, a very, very high energy family. But when I cook, people would sit down and we would have a good conversation. I still do that today with my kids and my family. And, and I worked in the technology business uh, to start. It was a very exciting time to be in the internet. But when I sold my company, when I sold Zip2, I, I went to New York to, to, to study cooking. It was a, it was a desire of mine, you know, now that I had, I had more money than I ever imagined I would ever have. Uh, and I said, well, if I have this kind of wealth, what, what do I want to do? And I wanted to learn more about cooking. So I went to study cooking for 18 months in the French culinary Institute. So I can cook a duck l'orange, uh, like the best of them. <laughs> and, um, uh, maybe someday I'll, I'll come to Paris and, and cook with some chefs there. That would, that would be amazing. Um, and uh, and I really am excited to come. You know, next year when 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 this is back live again, uh, I, think, I think this uh, Paris is one of the cities that comes up in my mind as as a place that is one of the great great cities in the world. Uh, and so I, I I happened to graduate just before 9/11 when the World Tra uh, Trade Centers were hit by the terrorists, and I live very close to it. I woke up to the sounds of the plane hitting the building. We started running. We, we saw the first one fall at Canal Street, which is downtown New York. Kept running. We saw the second one fall at uh, Union Square. And it truly just broke my mind. And I, I had, during this uh, terrible time, had this opportunity to cook for the firefighters. And again, kind of just where my purpose really came, was, came to me was this around food and what food does to bring people together. and connect people to, in the case of a restaurant, connect them to their family and friends. In the case of school gardens, connect them to the outside, to nature, to the climate, to understanding that the weather really impacts what you grow, how, if you look after your garden, it thrives. If you don't, it dies very much like the earth. And um, uh, that, that led me on a path to do restaurants. I opened the kitchen and next door eatery in, in Colorado, and now we've grown those around the country. And they started working with schools. But at the time, this was in the 2000s, I, I still wasn't ready to commit my life to it. And so I continued to work in technology, part of some exciting companies. But my passion was food. And uh, I kind of lost my way a little bit, as many, many entrepreneurs might find, is you get drawn to the, the, uh, the opportunity. And, and oftentimes, the opportunity isn't your passion. But it is the opportunity, and um, uh, and you can make a lot of money that way. But I had already made money, so for me, it was not, it was not. Again, money was not my motivator. So for me to do a startup which takes sixteen hours a day, seven days a week for many many years of your life, uh, I I really was not in the right place. And in, in two thousand ten, I had an accident that changed the course of my life. I went down a ski hill on an inner tube. It was a children's uh, section of the ski hill, not meant to be dangerous, but it was very dangerous for me. I got to the bottom of the hill, the tube flipped. I landed on my head going 35 miles an hour, ruptured my spine at C6 and C7. Uh, bleeding in the spine caused me to be paralyzed. I was paralyzed for three days, which is the most terrifying thing to imagine going through. But it was also a, 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 a divine intervention for me. It was, a, it was truly a, a, a way I could look at my life and say, you know, if they fixed me, if, they, if I could walk again, what would I do if I had a restart in my life? I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not going to not be an entrepreneur, but I'm going to do things that I care about, which really moved me personally. And one of them is Big Green, which, which is a nonprofit. We're now probably the largest in America, uh, building learning gardens in schools. We're at 700 schools. Uh, I think we're probably by far and away the largest, frankly. And now we've also, during COVID, we're doing the Million Gardens Movement, which you can learn about at milliongardensmovement.org. And we, around the world, we're educating people on how to do a garden at home, as well as in low-income communities in America and Canada, we're distributing gardens to homes. And in just one, one, one and a half months, we, we've reached over 20,000 homes in low-income communities. And our goal there is to create a global community of people who love to garden and who want to help other people garden come together 
at milliongardensmovement.org. Uh, on the square root side, what I saw was missing was young farmers. We don't have enough young farmers, and this includes in France, who's really everywhere in the world, because farming has become bad for the environment. We are farming mostly corn. We don't need corn. We've got plenty of corn. We're 40% of corn is being turned into ethanol because we don't know, don't know what else to do with it. It's terrible for the environment. It's terrible for the oil companies. It's actually the only thing I know of that both environmentalists and oil companies hate. And so working on an idea to, to create young farmers was our idea around Square Roots, which is an indoor farming company growing across the Northeast and the Midwest of the United States of America. You know, Kimball, you're touching a really important point here. People tend to forget the cost of pursuing opportunities that are not aligned with who we truly are. People get stuck on, you know, in their careers on a path, you know, and that is so difficult to get away from. And I really want to thank you for, for saying that because it's, it's always good to remind us that, you know, whatever important decision we take in our lives, always check, you know, how it is aligned with who we are and our values. So, so thank you for saying that. So going back to Big Green and, and, and Square Roots, I'm curious to know, you know, whether you have plans to expand beyond the U.S.? We do. Uh, well, the Million Gardens Movement is a, is a worldwide movement. It started on Planet Seed Day, which is a northern hemisphere uh, first day of spring, which is the day you plant a seed. And what I love about that is it is all about hope. It's all about resilience. And that's exactly what we need right now in the COVID world, where we're coming out of it. Uh, I know that Change Now is a virtual conference this year, but it's, it's part of the resurgence. It's part of us all coming out and connecting with each other. We'll be able to do, do it together in person very soon. And uh, Plant a Seed Day and the Million Gardens Movement is part of uh, the world coming out of COVID and, and doing it with a sense of hope and joy. So you've mentioned several times the Million Gardens Movement. I understand that it is a global community of people who, you know, like to garden and, and want to help other people garden. But why do you think it is so vital for people to grow their own food? Why, why do you think it can address the major, you know, health, mental, ecological crisis that the world is currently facing, especially in the wake of the, of the COVID pandemic? Well, I think that it truly is a crisis. The, the, the agricultural approach around the world has really been a, a, a disaster, both at a national and global level, but also at a personal level. Uh, what we are doing with our system is we are, uh, at a personal level, creating uh, obesity, people who, who are overweight, uh, massively overweight, and um, where they're eating high calories with low nutrition, so they're both over, they're, they're, they're obese and starving at the same time. Uh, it's a personal tragedy. At, at a global level, agriculture has become, uh, is now one of the greatest pollutants in, in, in the world. It is also one of the most difficult parts of climate change. And, and it's all solvable. These are, these are the reason why these, these things are, are the case is because of the past 20 to 30 years of, of the, the uh, monoculture approach to farming. And um, I, can, I can say that France is one of the countries that is really working hard to, to fight this movement, to actually become part of the solution. And there are parts of America that are working on that too, but it is a real crisis. Agriculture is a crisis of, uh, of polluting the climate, polluting the soil, polluting the waters. And then it is a crisis at the personal level for physical tragedy, mental, mental health. Uh, people are, are not able to uh, function well when they don't eat well. And then it is also an uh, environmental uh, crisis. You're right, Kimball. I mean, the impact, the negative impact of monoculture on, on our soils, on our waters is actually terrible. And I'm not even mentioning the fact that more than 50% of the loss of biodiversity can be actually directly linked to the way we eat. It's, it's really, you know, terrible and, and we, we must act on this as soon as possible. But let me ask you a more you know, a, a candid question. How do you make, how do you make it easy for people to garden? You know, I, because we were discussing it with Santiago who started gardening last year during the first confinement. And I'm sure he would tell you it's not a, that easy. So how, how do you make it easy for people to garden? You know, it's, it's funny. There, there is a, there, we've been working in the gardening space now for over 10 years. And there is a, there's an intimidation factor 
to gardening. That is very real. People are intimidated. And yet, once you have a basic idea of what, what you need to do, it becomes a wonderful joy and it's uh, very straightforward. And so the, the Million Gardens Movement, the, the website, milliongardensmovement.org, has the tools and tips that help you grow the right thing at the right time of year. That's also really important. So if you, if you grow strawberries in January in the Northern Hemisphere, don't expect good results. But if you grow strawberries in the summer, you're going to have wonderful, delicious strawberries. And so it's, a, it's about the timing and where you are. If you're in, if you're in France, you, you grow something different at a particular time of the year. If you're in Italy, even though those are pretty close together, you actually grow things at, at different times. And, and, and that's what the milliongardensmovement.org website is, is about to help you, give you, give you the, empower you to grow easily and with joy and with fun, grow, grow with your kids and with your parents, with your grandparents, bring people together for gardening. It's actually been uh, COVID for all of its terrible and difficult things has been wonderful for, for home gardening. And when we were approached by Modern Farmer, which is our partner in, um, in the Million Gardens movement, we were approached by them. They actually came to us and they were a very well-known online magazine on, on farming saying that uh, they're, they're getting uh, so many requests on how to garden at home and we were the top gardening uh, nonprofit, and they asked us if we would want to work together, and we agreed to do that. And uh, it has been a wonderful success. Uh, we we only just started, but I'll say that uh, two months in, we feel like we are making a big difference, and the feedback from gardeners around the world has been wonderful. That that's actually wonderful to hear, Kimball. And you know, I, I'm not that surprised. We see so many people fleeing the cities to go back to their you know to the countryside. You know, thanks to the, the, the flexibility given by the digital world we live in nowadays. And I think, you know, there's a lot more people that are going to start home gardening in, its, you know, in a short future. And I, that could become the next big thing. But, you know, I, while doing some research on your work, some, some figures really hit me. I, I actually came to the realization that more than 70%, 70, 70% 70 of people in the U.S., are actually overweight or obese. And actually more than 20% of people don't know that ketchup is made from tomatoes. I mean, when you think about it, I understand the end goal for you, which is to reconnect people with real food. But, but don't you think it's actually the whole food system that we should change? And, and if yes, how would you go about it? Well, you know, you're absolutely right. The obesity crisis in America is just awful and it is just getting worse um the numbers are uh not just really high you know 60 to 70 percent of americans are obese but if you look 25 years ago starting in 1995 obesity was under 20 percent just in 25 years it is now almost 70 percent and that is that is that means that it is something that in our lifetimes we created and in our lifetimes we could fix and so I, I think that while it is, it is truly devastating, it is something that can be changed in our lifetimes. And it's going to take a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people in the nonprofit world, as well as the for-profit world. Uh, as an entrepreneur, I see opportunity. I don't just see challenge. Um, but it is, it is absolutely something that we need to focus on as our society, not just in America, but because America exports its culture, it's, it's unfortunately exporting its food system, uh, places around the world are, are starting to see obesity issues as well. Uh, in Mexico, for example, obesity kills more people than gun violence and smoking. Uh, and gun violence in Mexico is so terrible to imagine that there is a bigger killer is hard to believe. Mm -hmm. And yet obesity is a much bigger killer than, than uh, guns and smoking. Wow, that's, that's a terrifying statistic that I wasn't aware of. You know, Kimball, Beyond the idea of, of reconnecting people to, to real food, it seems to me that it is actually the connection to nature that is off today. And I guess a lot of it can be explained by the fact that you know, we're nearly 60% of people globally that are city dwellers. And I think that figure is going to go up to 70% in a few decades. And I guess you know, 
that could really explain why we're so disconnected with nature. So my question to you is, how can we change that? How, how can we improve our willingness to preserve it? How can we put it in, on our leaders' agenda the same way climate change has been on our economic and political agendas for quite some time now? Yeah, absolutely. I, the, the connection to nature, I, I believe, is one of the greatest benefits that gardening does. Uh, what, one of the uh, uh, most beautiful things about our, our learning gardens, the, school, the gardens that are in schools, is that it gets kids out into the garden for 90 minutes a week on average. 90 minutes that they would normally be in a classroom, they get to be outside, they get to understand the weather and the, the changes in weather and how that affects their garden. Uh, for example, uh, in, in America, just this past month, we've had rain that we've not experienced in, in, in for example, in Colorado, uh, we have not experienced rain like this in 80 years, since they started recording the, 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 the rain data. And that, that changes how you garden and changes, if you, if, you are, if you are connected to nature and connected to the outdoors, you realize how much climate change is happening how much unusual events are, 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 are occurring that, that you get because you are going outside and you're growing and you're, you're, real, you're realizing, oh, you know, in our case, our Million Gardens movement, we provide gardens to homes in low-income communities and they're, actually, it's potatoes. We, d we did this this spring, which is a wonderful thing to grow. You, when they're ready, you, you dig your hands through the soil and, and you dig them like you're digging for gold. It's really a fun, fun thing to garden. And, um, our gardens can be moved indoors and outdoors, and that's been really important because with climate change and this very unpredictable indoor and outdoor, sorry, this very unpredictable outdoor weather, that is very important for our people, our, our community, our citizens to know, to, to be connected to that and understand how important getting our, our community and our, our world behind supportive solutions for the climate is. Thank you for this uh, answer, Kimba. You know, you've been a very successful entrepreneur, but you're also a very successful social entrepreneur. I understand that you were named the Global Social Entrepreneur of the Year by the World Economic Forum in 2018. Could you tell us, you know, what is a social entrepreneur to you and how is it different from entrepreneurship? You know, I, I actually do love the term social entrepreneur and I, and I, I love I love being called a social entrepreneur. I believe that that the there is a very simple difference between a social entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. And a social entrepreneur uh, builds a business that they believe the world really needs to make a better world. Uh, and um, frankly, the best entrepreneurs are all social entrepreneurs. They, 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 their, their success might be... Uh, something that isn't as well known or is as well, uh, maybe not a consumer driven uh, success, but, but uh, working on a, on a company where you believe that the success of your company will make the world a happier place, will make the world a better place to live, make the, the world a better place for your friends and family and your extended family, which is the, the global community, uh, and make the, the future generations, their, their lives better, that's a social entrepreneur, and I believe those are the best entrepreneurs in the world. Uh, my brother is a social entrepreneur in that way. Uh, most of the great social entrepreneurs, most of the great social entrepreneurs are social entrepreneurs. Yes, and I guess you're mentioning the fact that you know Tesla really accelerated the electrification of the whole car industry. But speaking about your bro brother, you know you're on the board of uh, SpaceX, and and Kimball. I really have to ask you that question. You know, some people in the audience will definitely tell you that before colonizing Mars, we should definitely focus all our energy and resources on protecting our planet. What, what are your views on that? Well, I think that we, we, we should uh, spend almost all of our resources protecting our planet. And um, if you look at my brother and his, his goal to, to make humans and interplanetary species, that's a very exciting and wonderful goal. And, and I am so proud to be part of that. And it's a very, very small part of what the world is doing. So the, the world is working 99.9999, you know, all the way to more nines than you can imagine on 
on protecting the world and looking after it, making it a greener world, making it a, a, a more climate friendly world. My brother also d runs Tesla, which is doing an incredible uh, job of transforming the world to alternative energy. Uh, but a very small portion of our time and energy uh, should be put towards uh, going, becoming an interplanetary species because it gives us uh, ex excitement that, that, that there's, there's lots and lots of things to live for in the future, including exploration, including being a pioneer uh, as, a, as a human species. So, Kimball, I have a last question for you. Are there any words of wisdom that you would like to share with, with our audience? Well, I would love to share how excited I am that so many people have come together across this virtual conference from places around the world. Uh, it, is, it is a time in our lives to really think about what we can do after COVID. When you think about COVID from the perspective of tragedy, there are a lot of issues with it, but there's also opportunity. And that opportunity is that you can now choose whatever you want. You could decide to change your career. You could decide to go start a business. You could decide to stop everything you're doing and do something completely different. And you have, you have a chance to do that because no one will judge you. You wouldn't even have to judge yourself. Many times when you start a business, you're really worried about failure or you're doubting yourself. Well, now is a chance after COVID, you could truly do anything. You could decide to go join the circus, literally, and people would be like, oh, well, that's just COVID, and that's fine. Uh, or you could go decide to go start a business in an area that you love and you're passionate about, uh, but no one ever expected you to do that. This is your time. Take this opportunity to uh, make the next chapter of your life the best possible one you can make. Thank you so much, Kimball, for sharing your story with us and launching this fourth edition of the China Summit. You know, I really want to wish you the best of luck, you know, with your fight, your really important fight against obesity in the US and all your effort to reconnect people with real food and with nature. It matters so much, you know, to us to have entrepreneurs like you that are really contributing and helping to change the game. You can count on us, you know, to support you all along the way. So, Santi, I understand that you're also with someone really special. So, back to you. Yes, Kevin, indeed. I'm with the great, with the fabulous Sylvia Earle. Hi, Sylvia. Hello there yourself. <laughs> well, we, this is a total honor, you know, to, to have you here with us for this opening uh, at Ch of Change Now. Um, well, the, the theme of the ocean is very important in the history of change now. It was one of the first themes that we really embraced. So that's why also we are really, really glad to have uh, an oceanographer, uh, uh, an explorer of the ocean, really someone who knows maybe the ocean uh, in their depths, you know? Uh, <laughs> so Sylvia, my, my first question uh, I would like just to, to know um, is, you know, for most of us, the ocean is the 100 meters or the few feet we, we have in front of us when we're on the beach, you know. <laughs> um, and still, the ocean is maybe one of the last parts that are not really explored. They are unknown, you know. Uh, I think there, there are more people going to the Everest than people, people going to the depth of the ocean. So um, you spend your life you dedicated your, li to your life to discover and know the ocean. Can you tell us a bit more about what you've seen during all those years, how that evolved the life in the ocean? In the 21st century, we can share the view that astronauts have given us. The world is food. <laughs> when you stand on the shore, as you say, we only see a few hundred meters out beyond where we are standing. But if you were really honest about the nature of the world, it is mostly ocean. And it isn't just a perfect. The average depth of the ocean is, is 4,000 meters. 4,000 meters. The maximum is 11,000 meters. 
and only a few people, about a dozen, have been to the deepest part of the ocean. So this is a moment in time, it's never before, that we, we know that the ocean dominates the nature of our home planet Earth. I've had the pleasure of spending thousands of hours under the sea. I've lived underwater 10 times. I've used more than different kinds of submarines. And I want everyone to be able to share that the kind of experience to see that the ocean is not just water. That's really important because all life needs water and earth is habitable by us and all the rest of life on earth because we have the ocean. That's where 97% of earth's water is. And as you point out, most of it has yet to be seen by any human. I feel really lucky. And if I could, I would take everyone, mostly to take you right now in a little submarine. People go in airplanes all the time, in automobiles, or even just walking around on the land, but in the ocean, to go deep, you have to have a submarine. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'd love that, you know? I think that must be fascinating to see life deep in the ocean, you know? And um, what gave you really the, or how and when did the call for the ocean happened you know i got knocked over by a wave when i was about three years old the ocean got my attention but it's life in the ocean i mean i wish i could take everyone down to see what it's like below where sunlight penetrates it's dark it's cold the pressure gets more as you go deeper but it's beautiful and the creatures who live there are innocent of anything that we do. And, but we are just beginning to get to know them, these creatures that have their own living light, bioluminescence. As you descend into the deep sea, it's like descending into a galaxy of little lights of small creatures that flash and sparkle and glow. Don't you want to go and see it <laughs> for yourself? Wow, definitely. But I think that would be, and this must be one of the most, you know, fascinating uh, shows on Earth. Um, <laughs> but I think you're really lucky, you know, to, to, to have done that so, for so many years because it's, well, lucky and also you, you decided it, you know, it's really like, uh, you, you made all your path toward this mission to, well, to, to work also on ocean knowledge and ocean restoration. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about um, really this topic because ocean is so important for the planet and what's your vision of the future and the future of ocean? If you could be born anywhere in time, I would I would think this is the right time. But we, we now are armed with the superpower of knowing what the smartest people who ever lived a century ago or even 50 years ago could not know what the children of today have this knowledge that did not exist, could not exist. As you pointed out earlier, that the ability to connect with the rest of the world, to see what we can now see, go where we can now go, if not personally, at least by connecting with people visually. We, we have this power of, of understanding. And now we know that Earth is in trouble because of our actions. <laughs> yeah. But it's not too late to turn things from decline to recovery. That's we are the luckiest people understand we can shape a future we have a choice 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, and indeed, we, we have the choice. We can do many things, I, I suppose, to, well, to help uh, the ocean. And, and maybe for many of the visitors today, there are very simple things we can do. You know, I, I guess uh, a lot of people here live near the, 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 the seashore or goes uh, to, uh, to the beach uh, for, for holidays. What can they do as simple humans and uh, human beings there on just on the on the on the seashore to protect the ocean. Well, there's many people seem to think that if they don't see the ocean or touch the ocean, it doesn't matter to them. But with every drop of water you drink, every breath you take, you are connected to the ocean. The ocean. Life, life in the ocean generates most of the oxygen in the atmosphere. It's been doing so for hundreds of millions of years. And we're the beneficiaries of life in the ocean that has shaped climate, the weather, holds the planet in a condition that is suitable for the life to us. <laughs> so, you know, we should... We all need the ocean. Now the ocean needs us because what we're putting into the ocean, even if you're far upstream, if you've never seen the ocean, what you dispose of, or, or even the burning of fossil fuels, putting carbon dioxide up in the air, methane, warming the planet, warming the ocean, changing the ocean, changing the planet. Everybody has an impact on the ocean, whether you ever see the ocean or not. The ocean has an impact on you, whether you see the ocean or not. <laughs> and, and now, again, why we're so fortunate in the 21st century, because we can see the connections. We can understand what no one could understand before, about right now, the, the way that everything is connected. And how you live your life, the choices you make about what to eat, about what to wear, about how you travel, and how you give back to nature. We have taken from the land and from the sea, you know, we've taken so much of the ocean. We need to think about the limits. You know, most of the big sharks, since I was a child, they're gone. 90% of the shark. And some people say, well, that's a good thing. That makes the ocean safe, right? No, no, it's not right. We need the sharks. They keep the ocean healthy. And they're really not a danger to us. The danger is losing shark, losing tuna, losing life in the ocean. We have a chance to get back. And, and this year, right now, it gives us the decade of of extraordinary focus on ocean exploration and care. So that in 10 years, 30% of the land, 30% of the, the water, the ocean and fresh water. If we are smart, we will take the action wherever on the planet we live. If you've never seen the ocean, you can still be part of taking care of the ocean. So what's to be sad about <laughs> time to be Excited, you can make a difference. It's time. Yeah, and actually, I heard you uh, say that no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. That's right. <laughs> so and together, yeah, and together, together we can go from decline to recovery, and then peace. And, and, and so here, I change, here, I change now. We we are gathering thousands of those change makers who are developing solutions. Um, for, uh, for, for the planet, for the ocean, we have a new coalition, the 1,000 Startup uh, Ocean for uh, Ocean Startups for the Ocean. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I, I just mixed up, but the 1,000 Ocean Startups uh, Coalition uh, that will be launched uh, er, uh, later today. Um, what do you want to say to all those change makers and people who are driving um, ambitious initiatives for, uh, for the planet? 
as we develop new technologies, think about being constructive. We have, throughout all of our history, taken, taken. We mine the land, we mine the ocean, we extract, take, we take, we take. This is the time when we must find the balance. We have to give back. We have to learn how to work within the natural systems that keep us alive. And, you know, <laughs> the things that we now can see that we could not see before, be aware of the impact that what you do has on your life support system, the natural world that gives you the air you breathe, the water that falls from the sky that we need to survive. Really, to understand, think like a planet, think like an ocean, do unto the ocean as you would have the ocean do unto you. <laughs> we, we have so many ways of exploiting the ocean. No, don't go there. Figure out how we can use the ocean without destroying it, without using it up, as a friend of mine points out. But there, but there's knowledge of the remarkable new capacity to explore the ocean, to understand the, the many ways that life in the ocean can teach us, can, we can learn from how fish move. D tuna, for example, we, we right now could, if we wanted to, we could find, capture, market, and consume every last bluefin tuna. But think about bluefin tuna with a different look, not just as something to eat. Engineers at MIT began looking at bluefin tuna as these remarkable creatures that move as fast as a cheetah in the sea. They, they, they are amazing. They propel themselves by moving the tail back and forth and then capturing the energy, little whirlpools that with almost 97% efficiency. Okay, how do people capture energy with that kind of efficiency? We, we can't, we don't know how. Fish do it naturally. Let's learn from them. Let's go into the deep sea, look at the microbes, figure out how do they capture the metals that are in seawater and deposit them in these little nodules. Instead of saying, let's go get those manganese nodules and mine the deep sea, let's mine knowledge from the deep sea. Let's figure out how those mighty microbes capture the metals. Maybe we could put them to work instead of destroying the ocean floor for short-term gain. We know how to do that, that's easy. It should be more challenging and more productive for us to learn the secrets of the ocean without destroying the ocean and put that to work to benefit us. You know, people sometimes say, I have to eat fish because of the omega oils. How about cultivating the microbes that actually generate the omega oils? We don't have to squeeze them out of fish or krill. We can grow those mighty microbes in small containers. It's being done by some clever operations. But what else is out there that we can grow? Pharmaceuticals, other sources of food without killing large populations of ocean life. That's the 21st century change that we need to be intelligent about using nature. We don't have to destroy nature to prosper. We, we can figure out how to work with nature. And we must, if we are to have a future that is really prosperous. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot, Sylvia. That's a wrap. Uh, that's a wrap. So thanks a lot for making us the privilege to be with us today. You know, it's a, you, 
you embody a lot of values we have here at Change Now, and so it's a pleasure to have you with us. Okay, great. So let's get the show going on now. The, this will start now on all the stages that the platform will leave on all the other channels. So uh, I hope you'll have a wonderful Change Now 2021. <laughs>